This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Happy New Year. I'm Dan, as always, alongside Matt, and we are back. It's been 10 games since we've talked last for the Flames, and lots has happened. Matt, how's 2019 treating you so far? Well, other than a minor leak in my house, uh, other than that, it's been fairly decent, and it's been good to see the Flames get back on their feet after a little bit of a struggle towards the end of the 2018 calendar year. When we first started talking about this season back in, I guess, July and August over the summer, I would not have expected the Flames to be number one in the West and and really uh, tied for second in the NHL coming into the 2019 half of the season. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, uh, I was figuring that they had a good chance to be one of the better teams, like especially when the the Windholm trade happened. I was figuring that that was going to... help cement the team as being one of the upper class teams but i was thinking like in the seventh to maybe fourth overall range not second but you know that's always good and frankly you know if it wasn't for mike smith's struggles through the year like we could have eight ten twelve more points in the standings just on games where he gave up bad goals so we could be right up there with tampa bay at this point of the season Well, we're number one in the West. I'll take that. So since we talked last, the Flames have played 10 games. We won't talk a whole lot about these, but just to run them down. um, On December 18th, the Flames lost 2-0 to uh, the Dallas Stars. On the 20th, they they lost 5-4 against the Tampa Bay Lightning. This is probably a game worth having a little bit of discussion. We all talked about how this game would really set the bar for where the Flames are as a team. And I thought we got a really good game out of these guys. I said on our last show, we didn't necessarily have to win this game, in my opinion. We just had to compete, and that's exactly what we did. Yeah, it was a shootout loss, and frankly, the team played well, and they easily, if the bounces had gone their way, could have got two points. But unfortunately, the bounces didn't go their way. And Fun game to watch, though. Oh, definitely. It was one of the more entertaining games. And it's a preview of this year's Stanley Cup Final. I was about to say that. I was about to say so, Matt. Is this a preview of the finals? Yeah, well, we need, we rematched with uh, Montreal after 86, back in, then in 89 and won the Cup. So it makes sense that Tampa Bay, Calgary rematch of 04 with the right guys winning this time if we're gonna do that though can we make sure the refs know what's in and what's out we'll just make sure that sam bennett does not shoot the puck on net at all <laughs> <laughs> he keeps getting every goal he attempts taken away so just you know you just don't shoot just pass always well, bennett, just pass. bennett actually <laughs> open flame scoring in this one true enough but so many of his goals get waved off Um, Calgary played one more game before they took a bit of a break for Christmas. And this one, you could tell that they were looking forward to Christmas already losing to the worst team in the West, a three to one loss against, um, the St. Louis blues took a couple days for Christmas, had a short road swing up to Winnipeg, uh, where we handedly beat the jets four to one. This was a fun game. I know my family was sitting around watching this after Christmas, a good game to get things going again. Um, the Flames on the 29th lost to the Canucks, 3-2. to two. The 31st, the New Year's Eve game, always a fun game. The Flames scored a ton of goals, an 8-5 win over the Sharks. I've said this before this season. When you score 8, you should win, but when you get 5 scored on you, you should probably also lose. So this is one of those weird games that you're happy you won, but when you're getting 5 on your own net, you should probably lose. Yeah. Very reminiscent of that Columbus game. Exactly. Uh, from earlier in the month. And Calgary had a weird month of December where they had games where they scored 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 goals in a game. We're going for 10. That's the New Year's resolution. We want 10. 
Mind you, St. Louis beat us. So I don't know who we're going to get 10 against. but Do we play Florida or something like that? We do, this month. Well, well there you go. We actually play Florida this week. Oh, excellent. The Flames opened 2019 with a game in Detroit against Detroit where they won 5-3 to three over the Red Wings. Um, they had a rematch of the China series on the third as a back-to-back game, a 6-4 loss to Boston. Uh, next game was on the fifth against Philly, a 3-2 to two win. And as you and I are recording this, the Flames are currently down 2-1 to one in the second period against Chicago. Oh, take a breath now. That's a lot of hockey, man. Yeah, just a couple of games in the last two and a half weeks. Well, something interesting to note, if we look at that Philly game, so between the San Jose, Detroit, Boston, Philly, that's Calgary's fourth game in 4.5 days, essentially four games in 109 hours. That looks more like a major league baseball schedule than an NHL schedule. Well, that is an NHL record for fastest turnaround for four games and just an absolutely ridiculous schedule that the Flames had to endure there. How much of this do you think has to do with the bye week? I mean, we see the teams are losing a week. If you were to look, that's really the teams, let's say, play three games on average. That's three games over a week that the team lost. Yeah, exactly. And you can, if you inserted a day here and there, like it makes stretches like that not happen. And But unfortunately, the NHLPA likes the bye week. And frankly, it's a really bad idea just due to the fact that uh, it makes like every month basically every other day the other thing i think we're fortunate looking at that kind of schedules we had no injuries i mean when you're playing four games in essentially four and a half days you're expecting somebody to get hurt on a game on a game schedule like that and i think we're fortunate we're coming off this road trip so far at least we got to get through the chicago game but pretty much injury free yeah, and like the Flames were lucky that uh, they actually came out of that four-game stretch going three and one, and they should have won the fourth one too, if not for Mike Smith. And then for the rest of the month, save for one game at Edmonton, which is a pretty quick road trip, uh, the Flames are at home, so that'll get them back in their own beds for a little bit, which is nice. Yeah, and hopefully they can go on a bit of a run. So with those games kind of behind us, I don't think there's probably a lot to talk about there. You- no, we lost all the bad teams, and we actually showed up for the games against the good ones. And that was a bit of a worrying sign because the Flames seemed throughout the season, any of the also-ran type teams, they tend to take them a little not seriously. Like Even though like they're bad in the standings, all of those teams have good players, and they the flames just kind of take it easy thinking oh well these guys clearly suck so we don't need to actually worry yeah well you look at like the detroit game they got down two nothing early uh, before pulling their head out of their behind at in the second period and like it was going to be another one of those type of games that they managed to salvage and even the philly game they weren't their best throughout the contest and thus far against Chicago they're not doing very good even though Chicago is frankly terrible well I have to wonder how much of that is the team not showing up for bad teams or if that's just the grueling effect of this road trip it's probably a little bit of a and a little bit of b but the fact that they're they're able to beat the good teams when they do play them shows that like they tend to take their foot off the gas a bit when they're playing the lesser teams. And sometimes they're able to still collect two points like they did against Detroit and Philadelphia. It's just that you can't have that consistently happen and be a actual contender for the cup because of the fact that you need to have that killer instinct where you can just roll over teams and just absolutely destroy them. And, we're not seeing that very much against the lesser teams. Yet the good teams where the Flames seem to be really good at controlling the game and, frankly, beating them. Well, in the end, if we're in the playoffs, we'll be playing the good teams. True, but you also have to realize that all of the bad teams, they're using Calgary as a measuring stick, and they're going to be playing their A games from now on So, because the Flames are the best in the West, and you always wanted to make sure where you're at when you're playing those type of teams and 
Calgary is not going to be getting any easy games from the rest for the rest of the season because of that. And the Flames have to adapt to the fact that even though certain teams are bad, they they can still beat you. Yeah, they can beat you, but I think there's also the question of how much energy are they worth expending? Like, yeah, they're bad, but especially if it's a bad Eastern team like Detroit, how badly do we really want that win? Like, you know, do we need to go balls to the wall and maybe hurt somebody or really, you know, tire our guys out, especially when we have three more games and pretty much in every other um, and every other day configuration on the road trip. At some point, do you just kind of say, well, we just got to get through this one? True enough. It's a different if it's team in the West, but if you look at this road trip, I mean, after New Year's, they really have all played Eastern teams. It's Detroit, Boston, Philly. Like, none of those teams are really going to have much of a an impact on our standings. True enough. So you can't go balls to the wall for 82 games. That's how guys get hurt. Oh, no. It's just that they, the Flames need to be mindful of not getting complacent. That's all. I think the, I think from what we've seen is they'll be fine. I mean, the trend shows that after a couple of games of maybe not playing the way they should, they always come back, at least this season. Oh, I know. Not like last year where, okay, and we're done. <laughs> well, we, you and I have talked about that, right? We've yet to see the big seven-game lo- losing streak or the big really seven-game winning streak. The Flames are just kind of you know playing steady hockey. And you look at any team, you even look at you know Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay hasn't won them all. Like, everybody's going to lose. I bet if we look, Tampa Bay's even lost to some bad teams. Oh, I know. Especially over the next couple months, the Flames are playing almost entirely bad teams. They just need to make sure that they're playing well enough where they'll actually get points in those games. And again, lots of Eastern teams here. So if there's, you know, if they do struggle a little bit, it's not going to hurt them all that much as long as they can beat the Western opponents. Well, Matt, seven weeks till the trade deadline. Can you believe it? When that calendar changes over, we can start looking ahead to the trade deadline already. Oh, I know. The most fun time of year when you're actually a contender. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you're not a contender to see what you're going to end up selling and what you can get for it. But when you're a contender, it's like, hey, what can we bring in? But as I've said many times on the show, to to get something, we're going to have to give something. And I guess the big question is, what do we need and what are we willing to give up for that thing? I mean, there's been some rumors that Tre Living's looking to shop for maybe a veteran defenseman, a uh, depth defenseman. I, my whole issue is I don't know what I want to give up to bring anything in. I don't know I want to give up a lot for rentals, and we've given up so many draft picks over the last couple of years. I think we need to keep our first and second rounders this year. What are your thoughts? What would you be shopping for? Well, I think the Flames need three things. One is a middle six winger of some sort, just somebody decent, not anything great. Uh, just another guy in the same caliber as Bennett type of thing or Neil just another option somewhat decent uh a a left-handed defenseman uh for the third pairing uh, just because having two rookies in the playoffs and both Valimaki and Shillington have looked a little iffy defensively and uh, obviously a goaltender to replace Mike Smith I think that the a forward of the quality that you're looking for, I think it's going to cost more than I'd want to give up. Uh, not necessarily. Like in terms of rentals, like for unrestricted free agent forwards, it usually it's not more than the second round pick, and that's if you're talking about a good one. Well, let's take a look at some UFA forwards here to see if there's anyone that strikes your fancy. I'm looking at the list here. I'm going to come up with one name right off the top that I think would be perfect, and that's Gustav Nyquist. Yeah, and I think Nyquist is a guy that if the Flames wanted to, they could probably get a longer-term deal done. I don't know if they'd have the room to. Oh, yeah, they could. Uh, Like Nyquist would probably be in the same bracket as Backlund. Four and a half, five million, and if the Flames get rid of Frolik or Stone, they could easily afford that. I think that if they really want to make a splash, again, they'd have to give up a significant return. But I, I could see this team if they really want to make a splash, going out and doing something big for Wayne Simmons. That's possible. I think that other teams might be willing to spend more. I, you're right. I think the price on Simmons is going to be high. 
Yeah, like I think that with Simmons, you're talking a first plus a really good prospect. I think a guy like Teravainen is the same, especially because he's so young. I I would probably say a little less on him than Simmons. I think you're talking more like either a really good prospect or a late first. What about a veteran guy like a Michael Raffle? That would be a all right if he's cheap, but I wouldn't be. Yeah. It, That'd be like, okay, sure, you know. Another guy that if they're looking for sort of middle six, I'd almost look at Ryan Dezingle out of Ottawa as well. He can play all three forward positions. That wouldn't be bad, but I think Ottawa might be wanting to sell him for more than what the Flames would be willing to pay. Call Carolina and get Ferlin back? I really don't want Ferlin back at all. I, I think that boat has sailed. I think that... Especially because he had another concussion. Uh, like, I I just... No, I was... Yeah, I was joking. I don't want to see him back either. Yeah. Like, I like Furland a lot. It's just that... Yeah. If you want to go the route of acquiring a middle six guy, looking at this list here, I think the cheapest acquisitions that the Flames could probably bring in that would work for what the position you're talking about would either be uh, Jonas Donskoy out of Saint San Jose, but they're not going to trade him. Or Joel Armia out of Montreal. I could see him fitting in well as a middle six guy. Yeah, that that would be a possibility. He's played with he's played with uh, Winnipeg. I think he he went deep in the playoffs with Winnipeg, so he knows what's expected there. Yeah, I think for Armia, you're looking at like either a second or a third and a all right prospect. And then you could even, if you want to get someone a little more expensive who might fit in there. I mean, you could go more with the veteran route of a. Justin Williams or a, you know, uh, even an Eric Stahl if you really wanted to go that way. Williams would be a very good addition as well, especially because he's such a good playoff guy. Yeah. Like, like game sevens, he's worth two goals each time. So, um, See, the guy I could see the Flames going after, but he has a no trade clause and I don't think they would move him, is uh, Marcus Kruger. Yeah, I could see that too. And then you were mentioning a, you know, sort of a bottom six defenseman. I know what you're going for there, but I also wonder with two options in both having uh, Yuso Valimaki and Oliver Shillington, is it really worth giving up an asset for a guy that really wouldn't be much better than those guys? Well, there's one player, and it, I'm going to go back to the same team, and that's the Detroit Red Wings, Nicholas Cronwall. I don't think it'd take more than the third round pick to get Cronwall, but that guy hits like a freaking truck. And the Flames don't really have a good hitter on the team f- from the back end. Like, Giordano picks his spots, but and Hamannick picks his spots, but Cronwall's won the cup before. Very solid guy, very dependable. Being a third-line guy, and he can hit like that, especially when games get physical in the playoffs, I think that would be far more valuable than you know not getting that kind of an asset but i he'll probably be expensive though well that's my thing i think there's a lot of teams that might be interested and i don't think with the bidding war that we usually see and the prices we see at the deadline i don't know if i'd want to pay those prices i'd even be willing to do a second for cronwall that's how i think that like it, it that sounds ridiculous but it it's we could use that kind of a tough player on the blue line for the playoff run at least and with his age i think the flames could end up re-signing him for like two and a half as well if we wanted to but i don't i don't think there's any room on the blue line to re-sign him you know i I think if you're gonna get a guy for the playoff run if you believe these kids that we have are ready or at least one of them is ready you got no room you'd have to move out a brody or a a hamannick in order to bring cronwall in and i'm not sure they'd want to do that I know. It's so hard when you actually have a good team that, like, oh, I'd like to get this player or that player, and then, oh, yeah, we don't have any room because, boy, are we so deep. I mean, if I'm looking at defensemen that can hit, I'd be looking at guys, maybe cheaper guys, like uh, Jordy Ben or even a Jake McCabe, who you might be able to get for a lot cheaper. Um, Both guys are making less than $2 million. Not guys you'd expect to re-sign, but sort of like the Nick Shore deal or the... Chris Stewart deal where you bring him in, you sit him in the press box for most of the time, and then you let him go in the summer. Like they play a certain role, and that's what they're here for. 
I know the guy that I would say to bring in there, but they're in a playoff position themselves, would be Brooks Orpik if you want a hitting defenseman. But Washington's not going to trade him to Calgary because they're both in playoff spots. But, um, yeah, I think if you're looking for that guy, I think it can be acquired cheaper. But to me, I'm not convinced it's worth paying the price for the defenseman that we have. We've also had really good success this year with some of our call-ups, guys like Quine. And I'm almost thinking that if the price is any more than about a third, I'd take the gamble of using one of our farm guys than going out and acquiring a forward for two months. Well, the thing is, is that I think that the Flames, especially because of our division, it's kind of on the weaker side, that the Flames have a very decent chance of going all the way to the finals, just due to how the playoff format is. And, you know, do you want to cheap out and not possibly win the cup just because, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's hard because like we're not used to being in this position where but if you look at this if you look at the way this roster is built too it's not like it's this year or we're out true you know it, it, let's say we as you say cheap out you might say okay next year let's make a couple changes maybe let's bring in a veteran guy in the summer and i think we can make a better run the year after the year after that like i don't think it's a one and done this season i don't either but i think that the flames could be in a position where like we're like this decade's Chicago or LA where I don't know if I'd go as far as Chicago. Well, Monahan and Gaudreau, Kays Tane. Remember the thing with Chicago though is every summer they had to trade away some of their key players because they couldn't afford them. Yeah, but you know, Trill Living Smart and got everybody on long term deals for nothing. You know, Lindholm making five million dollars for five years. Hannafin's making five million for five years. Neil's Good. making almost six for five years. Well, you got to have one bad contract in there. It's like a rule, right? You can't step on the ice unless your team has its obligatory bad contract. Batman's going to call and say, hey, you don't have a bad contract. Can I interest you in one of these other ones? No. <laughs> Future Phoenix Coyote, James Neal. <laughs> Going back to the Flames, though, the other thing that you were talking about, and I think we all agree on, and we, we asked fans for some thoughts this week on Twitter, and everybody mentioned the Flames probably need to do something with their goaltending. Mike Smith, every game he's playing, looks like, eh, maybe his time as an NHL goalie's over. Yeah, honestly, like after that last game against Boston and how he was kind of bad against Detroit... I honestly, I would rather have John Gillies be the backup. You know, we it we're in January now. We have the book. Smith's not an NHL goaltender, and it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. And so the Flames need a goaltender. If we're gonna spend assets at the deadline, I would rather the Flames because there's not a lot I'm willing to move. I'd rather the Flames kind of use all their assets to get a goalie first and then deal from whatever's left. I would hate for them to bring in a depth defenseman that's like, oh, we're out of tradable assets. Yeah. Well, the Flames do have plenty of tradable assets. It just depends on what you're looking at. Well, for a rental goalie, not many I want to give up. John Gillies? I, I don't think Gillies by himself, though, gets you much better. Right? You're not going to say, oh, let's take Gillies for, um, you know... Varlamov or Howard or somebody like that. Like I think Gillies and something maybe, but Gillies by himself is not that valuable. This is a guy who can't even stay healthy. Well, here's a question for you. What about trading Michael Frolik to Edmonton for Cam Talbot? There's two parts of me. One part of me loves the fact, and I know we screwed it up already, but the fact that Calgary and Edmonton never trade. We made some stupid trades. We brought in Smead and, you know, crap like that. But I don't know. I, I think for me, Talbot's a guy I'd go to in the summer. I don't know I would trade for him now. If the price was right. I just think that Talbot's going to be one of the more desirable goalies available if Edmonton makes him available, and I think the price will be too high. That's why I wouldn't trade for him now. I mean, look around the league at the top goalies. Bobrovsky's not going anywhere. No. Varlamov's not going anywhere. No. Um, Howard could probably move. 
he Talbot and Howard would probably be my one two for most optimal choice for a pickup. No, I mean, if you want to do a Gustav Nyquist deal, which you talked about earlier, you could do even money Smith for Howard, throw in a couple extra pieces like Smith, Froelich, and um, Mangiapani, and you could probably get Howard and Nyquist for that. Yeah. Well, we'd probably have to throw in like either a first or something or, you know, a second or a good other good player like Dubé or something because Nyquist is fairly decent. But, you know, it... There is a workaround with that, and it's possible. Uh, like, uh, if you went, like, big deal, you could go with Detroit and go Nyquist, Cronwall, and Howard. It, they'd have to retain some money on one of them, and Froelich, Smith, plus a handful of goodies. The other thing you have to be careful of, too, is this roster's working. If we make too many trades to it, we don't know what that's going to do to the chemistry of this team. True. But if you did go one-stop shopping, then at least the three guys are familiar with each other. Yeah, I don't know that they want to go that far, though. Uh, A couple other names here that I've been looking at. So I think, now, let me put this scenario out. To me, we're not looking for a number one. To me, Riddick is the best we're going to get this season for the price we can pay, but we're looking for either a 1B or a backup, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Uh, What would you think about trying to go to the Capitals and get Phoenix Copley? That'd be okay, but I doubt that they'd be really interested in moving him. I think that a lot of people, and you and I even talked about him earlier, Keith Kincaid from the Devils has some experience there, but I bet the Devils want to retain him. Yeah, I think that they'd be more likely to trade Schneider than Kincaid. And to me, Schneider is is not an upgrade on Smitty. No. Uh, He is, but not by much. So what if we were to go, and I know people think I'm crazy when I say this, what if we were to go to Chicago and get Cam Ward? Actually, I'm going to go I'm gonna go a different route. What about Corey Crawford? To me, Crawford is not a guy I trust in the playoffs with where he's at. He's old, he's slow, he's broken down. I'd rather take my chances with Smitty than Crawford and not have to give something up. I mean, if we could take Crawford off waivers or something, maybe... But I don't see the value in trading for him. Unless you can do Smitty for Crawford straight up, which you're not going to do. Um, so that's why I wouldn't do it. But I could see the Flames going with an older guy like, let's say, Cam Ward, uh, Ryan Miller, you know, even even a Peter Mrazek I could see them doing. I've, ta- I've said in the past I think Mrazek might be a decent option even going forward for Calgary. Um, I could see them doing a guy like that. I actually have those ones, if we're looking at it as a backup role, I would go with Cam Ward because he's a guy that knows the playoffs. He knows crunch games. We're probably, hopefully, not going to play a playoff game, but I would feel comfortable putting him in if we need him. What about Mick backup? <sighs> Curtis McElhaney? Yeah. I don't, I don't know that McElhaney is going to be worth the acquisition price. He's a solid backup, but there's so many of those out there. Um you know, I, I just I don't know that he would even be any better than going with Gillies. What do you think? Yeah, it's about the same. I I think he's better than like an average backup, but it's like Chad Johnson. It's like okay, but why give something up for a guy who's not much better than what we got? Yeah, like I wouldn't pay more than like a sixth round pick for that. So you could. You know, it, it's like if you really need a body, at, like if you're fully intent on Riddick being your guy, then, you know, and you're just needing a body, then like a depth draft pick for just a fill-in guy for like four games. I'm, I'm not overly enthusiastic either way. I mean, to me, to give up a draft pick for a guy who's going to play four games, you should be able to bring Parsons or McDonald or Riddick or even Schneider's look good this year. Give him the four games, unless they're playoff games. Like, you know, we should be able to find somebody to cover those. I bet there's even cheaper options like a Montoya or um, who else on this list? A Niemi, if you're just looking for a guy to fill the spot on the end of the bench. Maybe it's because of his last tenure in Calgary, but I'm still kind of sour on McElhaney as a goalie. Oh, he's not doing too badly now. Yeah, I mean, if if he hadn't already been traded recently, I'd say maybe Michael Hutchinson for that sort of backup role of a guy who might play four games. 
Yeah, I don't know. It's looking at the free agent class this year. It's there's going to be some interesting goalies out there. A lot of old guys. I mean, we got Smitty, Miller, uh, Ward. So I think there's going to be a lot of backup jobs. And I think there's very few pinnacle goalies out there. I've said it before to you, and I'll say it again. I think Talbot may be the flame starter next year, but I don't think it happens the deadline. I think it happens July one. Yeah, and that very well could be. I think that there could be a trade though made with Calgary and Edmonton, but. If you're going to trade for a goalie, I would I would almost go either uh, Philly and get Michael Newverth. That, that would be okay. Or if you really want to kind of shake it up, go to the Blues and see if you can get Allen off of them. Yeah, you'd have to give them a lot, though, I think, because they don't really have a lot in the pipeline. No, but I think Allen's a guy that wouldn't just be a rental. He's a guy that could be in the system as one of your top two next year. Allen's a weird goalie in that, like, I've seen flashes of him, and you look at him being a possibly an elite goalie, and then there are times where it's like, um, how is this guy in the NHL? And he's just very weird, because, like, there's no real consistency to his game. But even if you were to bring him in, I don't know what his money is, but even if you were to bring him in as a 1B or even a backup guy? That'd be fine. It's just... Uh, he's kind of one of those guys where you don't really know what he is yet. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying it's the best way to go, but I just, to me, I wouldn't get some throwaway guy like McElhaney. I think if you want to do it, go for uh, Howard or go for New Verth or go for one of these guys that I think we could pick up pretty cheap. I don't know. We'll see what they do there, but that's the biggest question. I would be, let's just say, in seven weeks when the deadline is over, I will be shocked if the Flames still have the tandem of Riddick and Smith. I don't necessarily think Smith is going to get traded because I think it's going to be a hard deal to move. I think with his contract, especially because it's expiring, that I think like if the Flames were to, say, go for a forward, it'd be like, hey, instead of you know, offering to eat some of the contract. Here's Mike Smith. And you got to remember too, the roster limits uh, are lifted after the deadline. So if they need to, they could easily carry three goalies. Tyler, the Duke on Twitter asked us, what do you think about a package possibly including Backlund to the blues for ROR? Yay or nay. And for those that don't know, ROR is Ryan O'Reilly. I'm 100% against that. Backlund's a better player than O'Reilly. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think Ryan O'Reilly is also a guy who is going to cost a lot of the deadline. And I think that if you look at uh, what the Flames would pay to acquire him, it wouldn't be worth it. I think if you acquire Ryan O'Reilly, you then can't afford Kachuk. So we have to make a decision. Do you want Chucky or do you want O'Reilly? Yeah, and frankly, O'Reilly is overrated. And he's been a locker room disaster in the past. And... I I just I really don't like Ryan O'Reilly, and he you know Backlund is an exceptionally good two way forward. He, offensively, he's kind of just okay, but his you're not paying him to be like the offensive superstar. You're there putting him there because he's exceptional at shutting other teams down. Yeah, and I think that that's a key here, that if the Flames were to move back on for O'Reilly, we lose a lot of what's made us effective, which is that backland Kachuk uh, line with whatever winger they put there. Like, I think you 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 lose a big part of this team. Yeah, and, like, you look at Jankowski, and, like, they're trying to groom him into becoming the next backland, that very good defensively two-way-ish forward. It's just the... Right now, Jankowski is not ready to take that role, and he probably won't be for another two seasons. And Backlund's doing a top-notch job and hasn't regressed, so there, like, there's not really any urgency to move him. So, I, I, unless you are getting a clear upgrade where, like, you're getting a first-line player for Backlund. It, who's a good first line player? I I wouldn't. I don't see the point in including him at all. You can't have all. all scoring guys either, and I think no. a big part of Calgary's success has been that they have a line they can put out to shut down other top lines. True enough. Um, speaking of Jankowski, while you bring him up, I want to give him credit. I've been critical of him this year, and in the last month, I've really thought that he's turned his game around this year. 
I agree. I think it was just him. Yeah, I think he, the NHL adapted to Mark Jankowski, and it took him a little while for him to adapt to that adaptation and to find his game. And he, he's carving out a niche for himself as being a very good, r- responsible defensive player who can chip in here and there. And his work on the penalty kill has been exemplary. And Hopefully he can continue to step it up and hopefully more of his offensive game starts to emerge. So we've said both of us nay to uh, Backland plus for O'Reilly, but let us know what you think. Let us know on Twitter or Facebook. What do you think? Yes or no to Tyler LeDuc's proposal? And if you had to pick one of the two, because really long-term money-wise, Kachuk or O'Reilly, who would you pick? So let us know that. We'd love to hear your thoughts. But... To me, I, I'm not as against O'Reilly as you are. I just don't think he, he's not a rental. I don't think we can afford him long term if we want to keep Kachuk, and I'd rather have Kachuk. Yeah. And frankly, Kachuk, by the way, what are you thinking with his contract? Seven for seven. Yeah. I'm thinking even six years at seven million. We'll see. I, I think the money's going to be seven. I don't really know the years, but. I mean, yeah, six, seven, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. Like, I don't see it being like seven and a half or anything like that. I don't know. I mean, as good as Kachuk's doing this year, you want to see him keep doing well, but at some point it's like, no, stop. You're costing us more money. You've got us into the playoffs. Ease off. Ease off. Cool your jets, man. Yeah. I, I mean, if you look at comparable money, he's a second line winger. And so I think it'll be hard to ask for more money than Goudreau. I think he's going to get it, but I think the money that he is going to get, because Goudreau's making $6,750,000, so I think that you can't make a whole lot more than Goudreau, especially being a second-line guy. And I think that's maybe the ace in the hole the Flames have in negotiation. I think that Kachuk, I don't know, I don't see him holding out like his father was renowned for like trying to get every penny from his team and like i think at one point he was getting like 11 million dollars or a season or something like that i i'm not sure that matthew kachuk's gonna be as aggressive with that because i think that the flames are gonna be selling him on well hey if everybody takes a little less then we can be stanley cup contenders for the next decade type of thing and i don't know uh, i i'm ho- i'm hopeful that he comes in cheap er than like seven and a half but we'll see i've said this to you before and i'll say it again today i think if we look say three years out goudreau's not a flame anymore i think that the flames will probably trade him when he's about 27 28 Kachuk will take the first line spot. I, we can, we could still get a good deal for Goudreau. You're not moving him because he's ineffective. I think they'll move him because Kachuk becomes the number one guy. And Goudreau, yeah, it, I, I don't want to say he's expendable, but you could, I mean, if you were to trade him now, and I'm not saying trade him now, but if you trade him now, you can get any goalie you wanted. Like, you oh, know, yeah. I think three years from now, he'll still be an asset where whatever we need, we can get for him. Yeah. And I, well, frankly, I think that the Flames, uh, it, would just really depend on what the cap hit is it, that Goodrow's looking at. Like if he's looking at like eleven or twelve million dollars, like Patrick Kane or Jonathan Taze, then you know, like okay, yeah, we're gonna we should probably not do that. But we'll see. And uh, like uh, frankly, Goodrow's going to probably cost in that realm. It's just that the Flames, if they're smart, they should walk away from that. Yeah, I could totally see them making a deal with New Jersey or Philly teams that, you know, places that he's from in the States and doing a big deal for one of those guys to bring in the hometown kid. And, like, here's a boatload of prospects and picks or whatever. Yeah, I mean, whether we want prospects, who knows where we'll be in three years. Maybe we need, like we did last year, we really need a right winger. I mean, even three years from now, you can probably get whatever you need in exchange for Johnny Goudreau. Yeah, and frankly, the team... Like, uh, you look at teams and, like, say, take Chicago, who are playing tonight, that, like, realistically, what they should have probably done was trade Jonathan Taves instead of re-signing him. 
and because he costs way too much and they could have used that to keep a bunch of their depth and they probably would be a good playoff team right now not necessarily a cup contender but you know a decent playoff team but instead they're handcuffed with a bunch of young crappy players like uh strom took his third penalty of the game uh, just a few seconds ago as we're recording and like you know it's stuff like that that costs that team a playoff spot and is one of the reasons why that they're rebuilding again and the flames if they're smart is to look at teams like pittsburgh like chicago like boston los angeles and see where they went wrong and try to adapt to try and avoid the pitfalls that they made so that way that you can kind of roll over being competitive while not completely bottoming out either yeah and i think this team i don't want to say learn from but i think after the throw again long deal where we realized that you know we really waited too long on that player to move him i think there might be an appetite to move a guy earlier these guys in the end are business assets and as much as you want to get the most out of them you gotta know when to hold them and when to fold them as they say you know you gotta know when it's time to give up not give up on a guy but when it's time to move him for value well, why don't we talk about a guy, I mean, Goudreau's a three, four-year term before we trade him, but let's talk about a guy who maybe there's some unrest and might be leaving town, and we all probably saw Alan Walsh, the agent for Michael Froelich, uh, went on a bit of a, I don't want to say a Twitter rant, but over the holidays started talking about maybe he doesn't feel the Froelich is in the best company here in Calgary, and we saw him say uh, in a tweet, many people in Calgary have been reaching out asking why Michael Froelich is a healthy scratch. Keeping one of the team's most efficient and versatile forwards in the stands marginalizes and devalues a great team player. Head coach's attempt to run a good player out of town? Question mark. So after that, there's been a. I mean, we've seen Froelich back in the lineup since then. He hasn't been a healthy scratch. Um, I. It's interesting when the agents get involved. At this point, if I were Calgary, I wouldn't say, "Well, his agent has, you know, posted this tweet. Let's get rid of the guy." I don't think you move him to move him. But I also wouldn't be surprised if they can find value to move him. Yeah, uh, he's a very valuable player to a lot of teams. And I think that the odds of him being a flame after the trade deadline are north of zero. See, I would keep him this year. I think if we're going to go, like you said, deep in a cup run, you need a guy like him who can step up into the second line. I could see that 3M line being a versatile piece for us in the playoffs. Um, he's still got some years left on his deal. He's got this year and next year. I think I'd hang on to him for this year and maybe look at moving him in the last year of his deal next year. Well, that's the thing. Like He is a versatile forward, and I think a lot of rebuilding teams would like a Froelich to help teach some of their kids. And like that's why like if you traded him to either Edmonton or Detroit or any of those type of teams to get assets that you're looking for... I think that'd be a viable thing. And like, if you trade for a leak, you're going to need to get a forward for sure at the deadline. That's a middle six guy. Well, I think if you trade for a leak, he's a middle six guy. You have to get a middle six or back. You don't trade him for a prospect or anything like that. I think no. for a leak is a hockey deal. It's, you know, forward for forward. Yeah. Trade the malcontent off for something that you need. And, and you know, Froelich has always been known to be a pretty good team guy. So I don't even know if, you know, he had any part in his agent sending this or if the agent was maybe having a little too much holiday uh, cheer, maybe a little too much eggnog and just went off on his own. But I wouldn't trade Froelich, like I said, just to get him out of town, thinking he doesn't want to be here, he's malcontent. I think right now the only way I move him is in a hockey deal. Otherwise, I'm happy to keep him on the team. And... Frankly, like if the Flames kept them, that'd be perfectly fine. But I think that just based on how the teams operated in the past, that I I would be somewhat surprised if he was on the team still after the deadline. I said this coming into the season, and I still maintain it. I think if you look at our active playing roster, he's probably the most valuable piece we have that we'd be willing to part with. Yeah, and like that's the thing. Like Froelich's not a bad player, and he would be valuable to a lot of teams. It's not that he's a mediocre guy that you're trying to buy out at the end of the year. 
It's just that if the Flames were to get something that they value more, then, you know, throwing Frolik in there works for their favor as well. Because it, it's solving two problems. You have a disgruntled player at, that you're getting rid of, and you're getting something that you actually need. Between him and James Neal and Mark Jankowski, that third line's cost us almost $10 million. Yeah. Well, what I would ideally like to see is a right winger to put on the second line with Kachuk and Backlund, uh, say like Nyquist, and then have Bennett go back down on the third line with Jankowski and Neal, and that way you have fairly good lines one through three. I don't know. I think you're right. If I can see Froelich moving, I think of all the forwards on this team, he's probably the only one I can see really moving of having any value. Guys are saying, oh, let's trade Neil, but that's not a contract anybody wants. Nobody wants Smitty. Like, I think of the NHL players here, he's probably the most likely to get moved, but it won't happen until the deadline. Yeah, and I, I think that, like, Smith is viable as a trade piece only in that hey, we need to get rid of salary. Can you take on this contract so that way you're not retaining salary on the contract or yeah, on the he, trade? But For sure. Know. He gets thrown in, but he's not a valuable trade asset by himself. No. no. Like, honestly, I don't even think you get a seventh-round pick for a Smith right at this point. Um, the only reason I can maybe also see them moving for a leak is he's making uh, $4.3 million. And that's money they may want to play with. So moving them out this year gives them that money then to play with in the off season. Yeah, I agree. And especially if they think Kachuk's going to be expensive. Yeah. Well, frankly, like you look at a guy like Dylan Dubé. Next season, he probably could step into for league's role, and be okay. Like he's not going to be I would as put good. Him more in Hathaway's role right now. I don't think you go from a guy you can't stay in the NHL to being a third line guy over the summer. Well, players develop over time, and you know, yeah, like, but generally there's not that somebody. Quickly. Well, you know, you can insert any of the number of players, like Lazar, like a whole bunch of guys. Like I could go through like ten names that could possibly be replacements as a third, fourth line guy. I think also with the way that Sam Bennett's been improving this year, I could see Froelich being more expendable because I think even money wise, a lot of his money will probably go to Bennett. Yeah, I agree. So, not saying they should trade him. I don't think this agent thing is anything on him. But I think it's definitely, it might open their eyes a little bit more to, well, maybe this guy, it's time to move on from him. Yeah, I agree. But Froelich's not going to get you a top-line guy, but he could definitely get you your middle six forward you were talking about. Yeah. Well, you got to figure that some teams are looking for very good defensive players, and Froelich, to his credit, is a top-tier defensive player. So... You know, uh, if the Flames are able to get a good offensive forward, you know, not great offensive forward, but a decent one, instead, that might work. You were talking about Dubé a minute ago, and we've seen him sort of be a yo-yo this year. He's come up, gone down, come up, gone down again. Um, I think you're right. He's ready for the NHL next year. I think Froelich's been a very important asset for this team, especially when he was a 3M line member. I don't know if I'd necessarily put Dubé as his replacement, but to you, does Dubé look ready this year? If the Flames were, say, the Edmonton Oilers and not very deep, he would probably be in the NHL still and be fine. Uh you also have to consider that for most of the season he's been playing on the fourth line with not overly skilled players and he's doing an adequate job like it's really hard for fourth line players to get anything going really so it's hard for him to especially as an offensive player because he's frankly a top six forward type guy watch it i think he's been misused on the fourth line because that's not his play style it'd be taking hathaway and putting him on the 3m line yeah like he's a small forward who is a scorer you know that just doesn't really mesh well like he's adequate defensively for his age but 
you know, you're kind of just wasting his offensive skill. Like, he needs to be at least on the third line or higher for him to be successful. And, like, if you're talking, like, a mediocre team in terms of depth, Dubé probably would be on the second or third line with, say, like, the Oilers. He probably would be on the second line right now. But, you know, it's one of those situations where he has to learn how to be better and he's getting time in the NHL to figure that out, but he's also getting reassigned to Stockton because, you know, he also needs to refine his offensive game and he's not really getting the opportunity up here for that. I think if I was the coaching staff for the GM, I would probably leave him in Stockton for the rest of the year. I think we have other guys we can call up for, especially a short term assignment. Um, and I think, you know, you tell him come into camp and you're one of the forerunners for a spot. But like you said, you've got to show us you can get a bit better. I think that Dubé will be on the team next year, but I think he just needs some time to mature in the AHL. Yeah, I agree. Um, I can see him and Mangiapani both competing for probably, I see two, maybe three holes next year on the forward ranks of this team. And I can see those guys competing for those two jobs. I agree. Um, so hopefully one of them will get a, get one of them. The guy I would actually call up next is, and, and you know I, I have a soft spot for this guy, but Curtis Lazar, the player who made history this season by being the first NHLer that's known to have asked for a demotion of the minors. How many guys say, hey, coach, send me the minors. I love riding the bus. Um, but he realized what was good for his game. And now there's an article from Eric Francis saying he wants to come back. He thinks he's definitely ready for the challenge as a – NHLer and to me I think you know what Lazar's a good hand if you're looking for that call up guy as a third fourth line guy maybe Lazar's the guy to give the nod to well who needs Brad for living you just have Curtis Lazar call all the shots hey coach send me down hey coach send me up come on let's go <laughs> you you just tell him you tell us when you're ready we're just we're not gonna make any we're, deals we're, for you yeah you... we're just waiting on you man that's right you remember the 60s Batman when they had that red phone that they call Batman with you yeah. have one of those to the to the GM's office. Um, but, you know, I think if if we're giving guys like Quine a shot, if we're giving Buddy Robinson a shot, why not bring Lazar back up, see if he has learned anything. He's looked really good in the AHL this year. He's got 12 goals in uh, twenty and 27 total points in 33 games, and he's been named as an AHL All-Star. So maybe he's one of these guys that, you know, he's a, a good AHL player and never going to be a good AHL player, but... Maybe he's learned something. I mean, is that not what the AHL is there for? Well, the, the thing is, is that like with the AHL, I kind of always look at how close a player is to being a point per game. And usually players, especially ones that have some skill offensively, uh, they tend to be around a point per game. And especially like when they're looking like they're ready to, for a call-up. He's and, at 0.82 points per game. And 27 and 33 is close enough where that's fine. And I think he'd be perfectly fine in the NHL. I don't I don't see him being much more than a third, fourth line guy, even if, like, you know, final product. But we'll see. And I think he has played well enough where he deserves the shot. But... You know, frankly, for the first couple months, he needed to be down there consistently and not have to worry about, oh, I'm going to be up and now I have to be on the top of my game this side or the next thing. He could just park it and figure out how to be a good overall forward. And he's showing enough where he does deserve a look. But I wouldn't be in a rush to bring him up either. But I think. You'll see him probably before the trade deadline. And again, I think if you look at this roster, maybe holes for next year. I mean, do you re-sign Hathaway? I think Lazar could maybe take that spot. I think he could take Zarnik's spot. Well, it depends on how cheap you get Hathaway. Like, if Hathaway's under 900000 which I think that will be the case, 
then you just re-sign Hathaway because I, yeah. But I mean, I think I could see. I think you're right that Lazar needed time to play, and the AHL was the right place for him to do that. He sat on the on the press box most of the year last year. He's not going to get time playing four minutes a night, but I think he's a serviceable fourth line guy, um, and especially for a playoff run when you know what maybe there's maybe there's time in those last couple games we always see it to call guys up and rest some of our top guys. I think Lazar, let's at least give him a look to see if he's developed at all. Well, also, uh, with him, he's a fast player. And having fast players available to you in the playoffs is always a good idea. Just because that's how the NHL's going. And that might make a difference in a game at some point. Here's a crazy idea, but if the Flames end up moving on from Froelich... Uh, at the deadline, what about trying a line of Lazar, Jankowski, and Neil? I, I'd try it. Why not? It d- it would depend on like what we get as well. Like uh, if we're we have a legitimate top six forward or whatever in the that that's the true deadline, then you know you just stick Bennett there. But yeah, and, but even then, I think a fourth line of say Ryan Zarnick Lazar is still a pretty good fourth line. Or Hathaway instead of Zarnick, that'd be perfectly yeah. fine too. Yeah, I just I think that it, with all the work he's put in, you got to give him a look. You don't have to keep him here, but you, I think you got to call him up, give him a look, and say, "Yeah, kid, you're right. You needed the seasoning. Welcome back." Or you know, what, kid, you wanted to go to the minors so bad, we're going to send you back there so you don't miss him, and keep working on it. And as you've said too, it it shows the team's willing to give you a shot if they think you're ready. Well, frankly, I think with him, uh, a lot of what his problem was was the, the lack of offense in his game. And like, if he's say brought up to be a, a physical banger o- on the fourth line, like even if his g- offensive game doesn't translate at all, and he just bring is being told to, hey, the other team's wearing a jersey go hit anybody wearing that jersey, then he If you want that, viable... though, why not just call up Lomberg? Lazar's bigger and faster. Yeah, but that's what Lomberg does already. I think I think as a third, fourth line guy, you don't need to be a huge offensive power. Um, you know, look at a guy like Jankowski. I think sometimes you just got to be there and not making a mistake. You're playing five minutes a night. Just don't screw it up. You know, if you're playing on the top two, for sure. But there's not a lot of fourth line guys we look at and go, wow, this guy's got a lot of offensive prowess. Like, you know, at that point, look at Derek Ryan, right? He's not doing a lot for us offensively or defensively. He's just keeping the, well, he's the not, game he's going. Not really that, he's not really that far off of his career normals. So, you know, Ryan's doing all right. You know, last year he had 37 points. I think he's on pace for 25. That's not that far off especially no, it, it's of not he was playing on the second line in carolina yeah and i'm not saying you can't get points but we didn't bring in ryan and put him on the four line guy oh, this guy's gonna be a 40 point player if he gets him great but you know it to me it's icing on the cake matt why don't we look we're looking at the current team why don't we look a little bit ahead next year the calgary flames will be playing another heritage classic but it's not going to be here in Calgary this time at McMahon, nor is it going to be in Winnipeg, the team we're playing. It's in a neutral ground of uh, Regina. They're going to be playing at Regina's football stadium on October 26, 2018. It'll be Calgary versus Winnipeg. I did some research. Do you remember how bitter cold it was for the one here in Calgary? I was there, so yeah, it was Minus 25 with the wind chill? Yeah, it was fun. I didn't want to go and, you know, pay that much to sit way up. So what I did is I moved my TV to the window and sat on the deck. I got the same experience as you and I could see better. (laughs) Um, But according to AccuWeather.com, the historical average high temperature for that day is 8 Celsius and the low is minus 5. So hopefully if we go by that, much better day for the team. Weird to see it so early in the season, though, October 26th. Yeah. Well, usually they have one or two that are, like, uh, abnormally early. So it's not that unusual. It's just, it is a little weird, though. This year we have to go to China. Next year we have to go to Regina. When can we just stay home? Well, it, it'll be nice to see. What I'm looking for is the Battle of Atlanta. The Thrasher's jerseys with 
the Atlanta Flames jerseys. Well, that was going to be my next question. I know you like them. I thought they were stupid. Do you think the Flames were another stupid jersey for this game? Do they re-resurrect the Ronald McDonald jersey again? I actually really like that jersey. I know you do. And, you know, it, I probably would have switched the red for black in that particular one, but... Well, if you want that, go buy the Hitman one. That's what the Hitman one was. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that uh, I'm hoping that it's going to end up being like the Atlanta Thrash or Atlanta Thrashers versus the Atlanta Flames type thing. But I think that it'll end up being some very retro themed thing. The Flames have had so much success with the retro reds. I bet they go with the, the 80s whites. And that would be extremely lame. I don't know. I can see... Like, that would be just kind of a cop-out to me. Like, come on. It, it's a one-off game. Do something special. Like, you know, like, that'd be a, uh, boring. I bet, they, I bet they'd sell a ton of them, though. Yeah, but that'd be really boring. Like... I don't know. Like, that'd be just really lame. It's sort of like Montreal's jerseys from that game against the Flames at the McMahon. Like, oh, gee, it's your 80s Montreal Canadian jersey. Okay. Yeah, that that's cool. You I know. can't see the Winnipeg fans appreciating the Atlanta thing. No. I know. It'll be interesting to see. I, I would probably prefer... If the Flames went back into the old time Calgary jersey well somewhere, like even if they went back to the Calgary Tigers, because I think the Tigers had like four different jerseys back when, and like the Bumblebee styled one that uh, they took the McDonald's jersey template from, like I think there was a couple other designs that they had. So maybe going back to that well might work. Or do some, or do something a little different. Like pick a different team and go for it. You know, like if you look at the last couple outdoor games of states, they're not even going with say an old team. They're just making up some new vintage look for that team. And I think honestly, if the Flames don't go with the '80s white, they're just gonna make up some random vintage look. Yeah. Or you could go, you know, appeal to Saskatchewan fans and make a green Flames jersey. They're not gonna wear a green Flames jersey. Oh, come on. That'd be odd. <laughs> if you want to see the Tigers and stuff, it's actually pretty cool. The Hitmen have been wearing all those old Calgary jerseys this year. They're playing what they call the Corral Series. It's the days they got booted out for the Flames from the Dome. And they're wearing jerseys from teams that played in the Corral, which is actually kind of neat. So you can actually see like the Calgary Tigers, the Cowboys even from the WHA. And they're not like putting the Hitmen logo on it. They're just wearing the old jersey. Yeah. Well, like... Uh... To go with the the green theme, you know, if you're a Game of Enough Thrones match. fan, yeah, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, they add wildfire, which was green in there, so you know there is some sort of precedence for it. <laughs> Enough. I think I'm Enough offending with the green. I think I'm offending literally any Calgary Stampeders fan with my statements, but so you know, I'll just shut up. <laughs> Do you want them to wear helmets that look like watermelon too? Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> the the other thing I can see them doing, just knowing this organization and their sort of jersey history, is you remember that third jersey with the script font on it where they sort of tried to make it look retro but not really? Yeah. I can see them bringing back that thing um, and going for like a pseudo, not even old, like really old, like the, the uh, McDonald's jerseys were supposed to look like, but just some random let's take retro pieces and put them together. Yeah. And put the script font uh, on it. And yeah. I am just hoping that it's going to be something interesting instead of something mundane like the Flames 80s home jerseys. Like, that'd just be boring. Like, just don't be boring. That's all. Like, I, you know, at least like the Ronald McDonald's jerseys, those were something different. Like, a lot of people didn't like it. You didn't like it. I thought it was kind of neat. I wanted to use that particular color scheme, but hey, that's fine. But at least it was different. And like a lot of teams, like they just tend to do really boring prototypical things, and it's just boring. What if they were to bring back the white 80s jersey for the alumni game? That'd be fine. Like I, I'd even be fine if that became our quasi-third, like a fourth jersey. 
type of thing. Like well, have the whole the thing red. is they don't want to haul two uniforms on the road. But, you know, you could just randomly go on a road trip just wearing the 80s whites for the entire trip. That's part of the reason that the, the league changed back to dark at home because everybody wanted a dark third jersey and then they needed to haul all these different jerseys on the road. And we don't even know which team's going to be expected to wear light or dark yet, so that's going to influence this decision as well. Yeah, true enough. What I'd prefer is dark on dark, and that'd be a lot more fun too. Because you're red versus blue, so, you know, it would work. Yeah, I don't see the NHL doing it though. Yeah. Well, they have done it before. We'll For see. me, one of the best parts of the Heritage Classic last time was the alumni game. What do you think the probability is that we can get number 12 to suit up? Jerome again? Oh, I think that's 100%. Definitely 100%. I'd be sh- I'd be frankly shocked if Conroy and Aginla weren't there with Shelena. And it makes you wonder, I mean, we're obviously not seeing a retirement this year. We would have heard about it already. You wonder if maybe the retirement comes after that. The Jersey retirement, I mean. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked with that either. You know, if they're bringing him back. But yeah, no, I can totally see that line of uh, Jerome, Jelena, and Connie again. We're almost done here. Um... I guess the only other thing I wanted to let everybody know of is we've got the Flames bye week coming up at the end of the month, and we're going to do something different for that show. That'll be the show that we record on the 28th. There really won't be any hockey to talk about one game, so we're going to do something different. We want you guys to be the star of that show, so Matt and I can take a bit of our own bye week. So instead of us putting together the whole show and talking for the whole hour, we want you guys to come on with us, be our guest host, talk to us about the Flames, whether it's the current season, whether it's your favorite Flames memory, whether it's your favorite Flame of all time come talk to us about something flames related if you're interested in joining us you can either come on the show live we'll have the ability for you to call in and talk to us or if you don't want to talk to us you can uh, leave us a message that we'll read on the show so we want you guys to be part of that one and if you're interested go to our website at firesidechat.ca right on the home page you'll see a button there that asks you to be part of that bi-week show and we'd love to get you guys on there's so many great fans that we have with such great insights we want to hear from you guys, and uh, it'll be, a, a, I think, a very fun show. So join us. Get your comments in. Uh, we'll be reminding you guys every week until then, but let's have some fun with that one. So, Matt, we uh, we didn't do all our predictions over the holidays. There's a lot of games. We missed some, but we'll just start again for 2019. Uh, four, four games in the docket between now and, well, I guess three games if we don't count tonight's game. Um, Calgary has essentially won this one 4-2 to two against Chicago. So three-game homestand. On uh, Wednesday, the Calgary Flames take on the Avalanche at a 7.30 start, back to somewhat normal time. Friday, the Flames take on Florida, your other favorite team. And then on Sunday at 7.30 at the Dome, the Flames take on Arizona. Still tickets available. The Flames still haven't sold these ones out. If you want to go to a game, uh, go to seatgiant.ca. Enter the promo code FIRESIDE when you check out. Let them know we sent you, but some really good pricing. I was looking at all three of these games today. Tickets in the lower bowl for about 120. Tickets in the uh, in the second level, you can get them for as cheap as about 65 bucks. So, see some great hockey. Hopefully, the Flames will annihilate these three teams. It's always fun to go to a game. So, check them out. SeatGiant.ca. Enter the promo code Fireside. Matt, what do you think for these four games, or I guess three games? I think that the Flames ideally should get six points you know but i think that they'll probably lose to colorado just because so you think that's the only loss for the week yeah beat florida beat arizona i don't know colorado's coming on strong yeah I think the Flames will get four points, but I think they're going to lose to Arizona. For some reason, they seem to have struggled against Arizona the last couple of years. Yeah. Could very well be. Um, but I I don't think after the road trip we've seen and probably the fatigue that's set in, I don't think we've got uh, any hope of getting six. Like, it is every other day, and, like, the Flames aren't traveling So after tonight, so... Hopefully they can just kind of take it a little easier and, you know, not be as frantic about things. 
Yeah, I mean, if we take a look at the schedule, it's pretty much all home games till the end of the month. We've got Colorado, Florida, Arizona, Buffalo, Detroit at home right till the 18th. They make a quick trip uh, back-to-back on the 19th up to Edmonton, but that's not much of a trip at all. I mean, they'll be back in their own beds that night. Then they get two days off. They play Carolina, and then they've got about a week and a half. Um, their bye week coincides with the All Star game. There, they don't play again after the twenty second until the first of February. So, I think that's what they're all looking forward to is that ten day break. Yeah, and then the, they have a two game trip in on the East Coast with Washington and Carolina, and then they're off for another three days. So some rest is in sight. Just have to get through all this stuff. Well, we got three games of the Dome, and I'll talk to you next week as we look at those and really look ahead for the rest of the month for the Flames. It's a short month here. Yeah, well, hopefully the Flames can continue on their winning ways and keep near the top of the standings one way or the other. But even if you're not number one, I mean, this team's not falling out of playoff contention oh, no. unless something they've really already, bad happens. Frankly, they've already made the playoffs. Like, if they just go 500 the rest of the way, they'll have, like, 96 points. So, like, they're they're fine. It's just trying to get, you know, we want to be, like, one of the top tier teams not having to take the harder route. Because, like, frankly, like, if in the first round we're playing either Vegas or San Jose, that's a lot tougher than say like minnesota vancouver edmonton or any of those other teams that would squeak in so yeah i i don't know if we're gonna be number one for the whole uh for the whole season but i have no doubt that we'll be on the easy road i think we'll be one of the top teams and that'll that'll be no problem i'm just hoping that they they're at the top of the division at the least so that way they're not facing as hard of an opponent in the first round I think that based on the the teams behind us and the fact that we've been pretty consistent, I think as long as the Flames keep their consistency up, they'll probably be one, maybe two. Yeah, because if you look at the standings, like uh, Colorado's third in the the Central, and they're tied with Dallas, who's the first wild card team, and then you have Minnesota, Anaheim, Vancouver, and Edmonton that are all within two points of eighth. So you know, like none of those teams really much of a danger frankly to the flames so like i'd rather face one of those say six teams than having to play san jose or vegas in round one let let those two teams beat each other up and then we we take the winner well matt have a good week enjoy these three games and we'll talk to you next week have a good one and as always go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.